Howdy, folks. Um, so good to be here with you again. I uh, sound like a broken record every time I do my introduction to these messages. But it's true. And it is very good for me to be here with you. And I thank you for inviting me in your places. I'm not sure if you've been tracking along with Redwater Alliance and our messages here on YouTube or Facebook or on our website. Nevertheless, uh, we concluded our Ephesians um, series uh, last Sunday, last weekend. And um, that uh, video is posted. It's called Bessinger. If you haven't seen it, uh, take a look at it. Have a listen to. Um, I believe it will bless you. Um, God's word always blesses me. I hope it blesses you as well. Uh, we are in, uh, today's September the 1st. Where has August gone, right? Um, well, September the 1st leads to Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, which here in Canada is Labor Day weekend. It's an official weekend holiday, or Monday's official holiday. Uh, yes, of course, some kids have gone back to school, but then they get a little weekend off before they get right into the books. Um, we are not going to beginning, uh, begin a new series um, uh, until probably October the 1st. So uh, I will keep you up to date on what's going on there as it comes along. So today's message is really uh, prepared for this coming Sunday. Today's Friday. On Sunday, uh, our church will be at uh, family camp. We've done this pretty well since I've been pastoring here over eight years. And uh, we go there to this beautiful lake in Alberta here, believe it or not, a nice spot. And we have a family camp, and on Sunday, we, there's a chapel. We, we're on a Bible camp, and there's a chapel. We have our service there, and we'll be celebrating a communion. Uh, and this particular message will be the message that I will preach then. And then we're going to have uh, one of my favorite things about being a pastor is baptism. We're going to baptize a couple of, couple of young people in the lake there. I'm so excited about that. All that to say, again, thank you for having me. There's a story of a, a missionary in South America. Uh, this comes all out of the uh, Reader's Digest. I can't remember what uh, issue or year. There's a story of this missionary in, in South America that when the temperatures climbed up to 120 degrees, uh, as they often did, I imagine there, was tempted to cool off in the local river. However, he was, he was concerned over the the man-eating fish, the piranha, that were common to the river, and rightly so. Yet the locals had assured him that uh, piranhas would only bite people when swimming in large numbers in schools, which, according to the locals, never did in this particular part of the river that they were located. You know, assured, I guess, the missionary decided, well, he would spend as much time as he could when it was really hot, cooling off in the river. So some time went by, when the missionary then heard that a local fisherman had fallen out of his boat and has not been found. Of course, this startled him, and rightly so, I suppose. And he asked if it was possible the man was eaten by piranhas. Again, the locals assured him uh, that the, uh, it was only possible when they were swimming in large groups and large numbers that they would attack or bite. And they never swim in these areas in those numbers that they were living at. But the missionary asked another question. Why not around here? And the locals responded, they never swim in large numbers where there are alligators. Well, here's the point of the story. Asking the right questions and getting the correct answers can mean the difference between being safe or an alligator's snack. We go to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, often called call the synoptics, the synoptic Gospels. In there we find a parallel account of when Jesus asked particularly two questions. The first question he asked his disciples, who do the crowds say I am? And they gave him some of the responses of the, what the people would have said. Well, you're John the Baptist, or he may be Elijah, or maybe he's one of the other prophets of old who have risen and returned. But then he asked them a second question. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? You know, this question, who is Jesus, has been asked and answered in many ways 
and many times over the 2,000 years or so since Jesus was walking the earth. You just can do a survey. It doesn't take long and much of an effort. Uh, the major religions teach certain things about Jesus. Some would say that Jesus was a prophet, a good teacher, and even a godly man. It would not be hard-pressed to find, I think, someone who might call themselves an atheist or agnostic that would agree that Jesus of the history of history was a good teacher, a good man who cared about others. What about Jesus? Who did Jesus claim to be? And what does the Bible say he is? Well, please turn it in your Bibles to John chapter 1. And we're going to read together the first 18 verses. Chapter 1, verse 1 to 18. Uh, please join me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes um, after me ranks before me, because he was before me. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the, right father, at the, who is at the Father's side, pardon me. He has made him known. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for this wonderful um, introductory to the Gospel of John. And uh, Lord, we ask by your spirit you'll that you would guide us through this as we, we hear about some of these things in this um, particular text that we're looking at, that you would, uh, by your Spirit, uh, enlighten our minds and inform our hearts. And, and Lord, uh, and during this process, whatever you ask us to do, that, Lord, we be obedient to it and follow through on it. And we thank you and we pray uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. So our, our focus will primarily be within the, con, within the confines of the first five verses of John's Gospel here. Yet, these five verses are found in the context of John's introductory statements concerning Jesus Christ. So what we have in a way here in these first 18 verses is an interesting um, thing that John has done here. He is really summarizing uh, of the person and the work of Jesus Christ that he later expands on in the remaining gospel account. Some would say this is John's prologue, and we are told of the Son of God who was sent into the world, a world that the Son of God created to become the Jesus and Messiah of history, so that the glory and grace of God the Father would be uniquely made manifest or known or shown in God the Son. Also, in John's prologue here, he introduces us to some of the key themes that we find in the rest of the gospel. Uh, key sort of words here in regards to that are light and life and darkness and witness and true and world and glory and truth that we find in these first 18 verses. Now, more could be said, absolutely. But it will have to suffice for today as we turn back to the question that was asked moments ago, who is Jesus? And my friends, in the whole of the New Testament, there is no other book or letter that can be found there that best describes and explains Jesus the Christ as here in John's Gospel. And it's no wonder that John's Gospel is used, as I often do, 
and others over the centuries actually by many to help under, help people understand the deity the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ you know John's gospel is a go to gospel to help people who are asking who is Jesus and what did Jesus do and it is in part because of this gospel that John has often been given the title or moniker of John the Evangelist. And of course, John's gospel is ideal for Christian evangelistic efforts. It is the one uh, book I would recommend uh, to a a brand new Christian to read first or to a seeker or to someone who has questions, to John's gospel would be the place to go. So with this in mind, let's now turn our attention to verse 1 and 2, which was just read, but let's read that together again. Verse 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Please notice with me the phrase, in the beginning. It might sound familiar to you. But the question is this, how are we to understand what John meant by in the beginning? We go to the 17th chapter of John's Gospel, which is in that piece of scripture there is uh, often called the High Priestly Prayer of Jesus. And we encounter that intimate moment with Jesus as he prays to God the Father for himself as he soon to face the cross and death and all that that meant for him. That he prays for his disciples and then he would pray for those who would would come to believe in him down through the centuries, even you and me. He's praying for us there. And we draw up into the prayer where Jesus prayed, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. Chapter 17, verse 5 of John's Gospel. So we go back to the question, how are we to understand what John meant by in the beginning? You know... This reminds us probably of Genesis 1, verse 1. And that's true. This is the only place that we can go in our minds. As far back as the moment of creation where we read in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But what John is speaking of here is of Jesus' pre-existence, before creation, before anything existed, my friends, was the word, verse 1. John declares plainly here for us that Jesus was pre-existent before anything was made, and two, that he's co-eternal with the Father. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. We need to keep in mind, as one commentator put it so well, by definition, God has no beginning and no end as well. So what John was declaring here in his gospel concerning Jesus is beyond the ability of our finite intelligence and knowledge and everything to really grasp the full comprehension of what it means that Jesus was in the beginning with God. Nevertheless, when we speak of Jesus Christ as believers, we must understand that Jesus is not bound by time and space. As one ancient believer said so many years ago about Jesus, there never was when he was not. Therefore, my friends, Jesus is co-eternal with God. One, Jesus was eternally with God, and in a sense, uh, we're t- they're talking about his pre-existence. And two, Jesus is co-eternal with God. And the third uh, declaration that John makes in these verses that we're looking at here, these five verses, that Jesus Christ is God. We see this in verse 1 at the tail end, where John said the Word was God. The Word was God. The writer of Hebrews helps us here. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the writer said, He, that is Christ, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Well, as the writer has so well put it here, Jesus is the exact imprint of his nature. Whose nature? The nature of God. Therefore, Jesus is God. He is one with God. Jesus was one time walking in the temple of Jerusalem, and some Jews had come around him. uh, I think this was during the Feast of Dedication. 
And they challenged him. They challenged Jesus as to his identity. And they said to him, How long will you keep us in response? In suspense, pardon me. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. John chapter 10, verse 24. Well, among the things that Jesus said in response to their obvious baiting of Jesus, he said this towards, he said this, I mean, I and the Father are one, John 10, 30. I and the Father are one. And their response was immediately to pick up stones to stone him. Because you see, in their eyes, what Jesus just said there was blasphemy. Jesus was saying, you make yourself. Jesus was saying, they were saying Jesus was sick. <laughs> Jesus to them was saying, you make yourself God. In other words, you are calling yourself God. John 10, 33. Well, that was a marble, bunch of marbles. Well, let's try and clarify what I just said. One, Jesus was with God before anything existed that exists. Two, Jesus is co-eternal with God. Jesus is not bound by time and space. And th while he was on the earth in his human body, in his full, when he was fully human, yes, he was bound by it, but not as God, because he was also fully God at the same time. Three, there is no distinction in essence between God and the Word, or the Father and the Son, we could say. Another way that's often put together, God and the Word, or the Father and the Son, both, that's the same, are co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent. So back to the question, who is Jesus? Because you see, my friends, how one answers that question, the Bible has so far taught, taught us, is critical and crucial and very important. You know, as I speak today, there are thousands of people getting up every morning like we do and going to bed every day and then going to worship every week that believe the Bible is God's word. That they seek and they seek to obey its moral uh, guiding, guiding principles and standards. They believe in the virgin birth of Jesus, which is crucial for the Orthodox Christianity. They believe that Jesus went to the cross to free humanity from sin and death. They, that if a person places their faith, their trust in Jesus, they can have their sins forgiven and attain uh, eternal life. Now that sounds biblically accurate, doesn't it? It's Orthodox Christianity sort of in a nutshell. But what if I told you what I just said is affirmed by the Watchtower Society, 1996, pages 6 to 7, which answers the question, what does God require of us? Yet, the Jehovah Witnesses, my friends, deny the deity of Jesus Christ. They say that Jesus is a powerful spirit who lives in heaven. That Jesus was created by Jehovah God before anything else. How about you? How would you answer the question, having heard what John here said in five verses, who is Jesus? You see, John's gospel tells us of the events of the Jesus, the Messiah of history, who by many convincing proofs, miracles and signs and wonders, reveals his identity as truly God and truly human at the same time. Jesus was truly God and truly human. Theologians call this the hypostatic union. I'm not going to try and explain that. It's there for you to figure out, I think. God the Son, who called himself the Son of Man, my friends, is co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent with God the Father. And here's the, here's the crux of the, of the issue with this question, who is Jesus? If someone denies Jesus' deity, even though believing other things of Jesus, they are not saved from their sins. And unless they repent of their unbelief, will one day face the judgment of God. Well, moving along, John goes on to tell us that it was through him, here in verse 3, that through the word all things were made. Without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 3. The Apostle Paul, in his letter, puts it, puts it this way. Paul said, for by him, that is Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That's Colossians 1, 16 to 18. And here's the point. Jesus was God's agent, if you will, in creation which means all things, the supernatural and the natural, were created by him. 
And in simple, plain language, my friends, you and I exist because of Jesus, and we continue to exist because of Jesus. And because the Word is the absolute starting point of everything, John tells us that the Word is a source of life and light. Verse 5, in him was life, in Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. And that word men is speaking of all humanity. King David proclaimed this of God, For with you is the fountain of life, in your light do we see light. Psalm 36, 9. The Apostle Paul speaking in the temple after a lame beggar was healed, in response to the crowds, he said, that the author of life, which they denied, he said, whom, whom God raised from the dead, and his name by faith in his name, has given this man his perfect health. Acts chapter 3, 1 and following. Friends, Jesus, as one commentator put it, the divine originator of life. Jesus is the divine originator of life. As John had already stated here at verse 1, in him was life. And from in him was life, which comes, and, and from in him who was life, pardon me, comes his light by which we see light, verse 5. It's already been stated, John introduced words pointing to certain truths. And here in verse, verse 4 and 5, we have contrasting themes of light and life, life and light. And we find throughout the gospel, John John Prologue reveals that life and light are qualities found of the eternal word, found of Jesus Christ. Jesus even said one time, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. John 6, 35. John, uh, Jesus using a metaphor to describe that he is the very bread of life. Jesus also said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John chapter 8, verse 12. My friends, Jesus is life and light. John also talks about darkness here in verse 5. And what about the darkness? Well, we have contrasting themes here, don't we? John does this in his gospel. We have light and darkness. So friends, it is in the word that is Christ that shines his light into the darkness. And when we think of this word light in the Bible, it often refers to the biblical, to biblical truth, the truth of the Bible itself, while darkness refers to error or transgression, truth to the word of God, from God himself, versus error or transgression. For example, concerning light, the psalmist said, Maybe some of you would remember this. You might be learned it as a kid. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. Concerning darkness, the apostle Paul exhorted the Ephesians to no longer walk as Gentiles do. Ephesians 4, 17. Why? Because they are darkened in their understanding. And on and on, he would say. Light in the Bible can also refer to holiness and purity or purity. John, in his first letter, said this, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is light. He is pure holiness. Darkness can also refer to sin. John writes, John said in chapter 3, People love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. That's verse 19 of chapter 3. Well, with these examples, we come back to our text. Notice how John applies this, uh, his thematic words. He does so metaphorically, doesn't he? So when we think of light and darkness in the natural world, we understand that darkness is simply the absence of light. We walk into a dark room, and with a simple flip of a sweet switch, the darkness has no choice but to retreat. The light shining out of a lamp in the room dominates that once darkened room. And it's interesting to note that it doesn't take a powerful light source to chase away the darkness, for even the light of one candle, gand, candle dominates over the darkness. John said here in verse 9, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. 
And my friends, this light was more than the light of a candle or the light of a, in a house. This light was more than the light of a candle, even more than the light of a sun shining over the noonday. For John said in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And this was a glory as of the glory uh, as of the only Son from the Father, who was full of grace and truth, verse 14, and the darkness has not overcome his light. Well, this brings us back one more time as we sort of bring this to a close. Who is Jesus? My friends, the answer to this question is crucially important. If you call yourself a Christian, you need to know the answer to this question from John's Gospel, from the Bible. Because when we read through John's Gospel, we find many therein who rejected Jesus, as John defines them here in our text here, verse 1 to 5, 1 to 18. We find others who, not unlike many today, would find Jesus, uh, uh, define Jesus as a good teacher or a good, ma- good man. We find others in John's Gospel who outright consider Jesus a false prophet, even demon-possessed. My friends, how one answers this question, who is Jesus, is crucially important. John highlights also here in our text here in these first 18 verses that some did receive Jesus as he truly is, the one sent by God, the true light full of grace and truth. And to those who received him, John said, who believed in his name, who gave He gave the right to become children of God who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 12. So this boils it down to one last question that I want to ask you. Actually, I'm going to let Jesus ask you. The question that he asked his disciples. Jesus is asking each and every one of you who hears this, who sees this, or both, Who do you say I am? The answer to that question is very important. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time together in this wonderful gospel of John. Thank you for the Apostle John who was with you, who discovered the truth, and who tells us about that in his gospel. I pray for those who uh, heard this message. I pray, God, for those who are not uh, followers of Jesus Christ that are considering this question. I pray, God, that you would show them your light and your truth. I pray for those uh, of us who are looking at this question maybe because of our, uh, maybe struggling in our faith or or whatever situation in our life, I pray, God, that you would help them understand that if they have believed on Christ, they are sons and daughters of God. Help them in their moments, Lord. Help them through this time. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, folks. Happy Labor Day weekend if you're from Canada. God bless. Shalom.